front, turn off your mobile phones if you have them on. Um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our next speaker. Um, I know uh, of this person through uh, and his work with uh, OOXML standards and various things over the last few years. And today he's going to be talking to us about trade practices, issues of infringing open source software. Um, may I introduce Brendan Scott. Thank you very much, and um, thank you for having me here today, everybody. And it's nice to see you all turning up to a, uh, a talk which is about the law rather than about um, video standards or whatever it is that you've been listening to so far. Um, my name is Brendan, and that's me up on the screen. Uh, I'm a lawyer. I'm uh, based in Sydney, and I do technology law. So that's stuff like uh, software licensing, development contracts, those sorts of things. Today I'm talking about um, uh, consumer law issues which um, uh, which you might be running into if you're selling an embedded device or any other device or any other thing actually which has open source software on it if that open source software is infringing or improperly licensed. So, uh, too long, didn't listen. The, uh, the summary of the talk is you'll be in trouble. Don't do it. Uh, and um, the, uh, the essence of the talk is not so much that you'll be in trouble, don't do it, but rather that you'll be in trouble with people other than the copyright holder, right? Because um, traditionally the way people have thought about this is if you're the copyright holder, then you'll go and sue somebody and um, that's what you've got to, look out, got to look out for. So this, this, this presentation is actually talking to um, a piece of research that I did for Linux Australia. Um, uh, halfway through last year uh, it was released. Um, and uh, it was looking at whether or not consumer law uh, could be used to enforce compliance of open source uh, software licences. And uh, the output of that work was a research note. And that research note, if you, I mean, I'm sure you've already got a copy, but if you don't have a copy with you at the moment and you want one, you can get it from that URL. Uh, and it's open, openly licensed, so feel free to share it if you like. And this talk is basically talking to that note. Uh, so if you happen to fall asleep halfway through the talk and you miss what I've said and you can't find the video, you can still look at the note. And in fact, the note has more details than what I'm going to talk about today. I'm just going to be talking about some, well, actually, just two of the big guns in the note um, that are in there. And before I go on, I should uh, make a, a bit of, a, bit of a, a comment here that on the first slide you see I've put trade practices in square brackets. That's because when I did the note it was the Trade Practices Act and it had been the Trade Practices Act for like, you know, 36 years before that. But as at 1 January this year they changed the name of the Act. So it's not the Trade Practices Act anymore. Uh, it's the Competition and Consumer Act. And not only did they change the Act, they actually moved bits around and put this over here and changed some of the wording. Um, so I was faced with this issue of, well, what do I do? I change it all and then I'm out of sync with the research note, or do I stick to the research note and then I'm sort of out of sync with reality? Um, and I've chosen the latter rather than the former. But what I have done is, um, if you are really interested in knowing what the actual sections are these days, um, uh, there's a, a slide at the end of this talk which does the mapping from uh, what I'm talking about to, or th from the words that I'm using, which is like section 52 and section 53, to what those sections are um, these days. And um, the good news is that, or the, the bad news is that some of the wording has changed. So the key sections that I'm looking at, some of the wording is not exactly the same when they moved it from where it is to, from where it was to where it is within the Act. But the good news is that uh, the changes aren't that great. So I don't think um, the change that they've made to the Act makes any, any difference to the analysis that, I'm, that I've uh, put forward in the, in the, um, that's in the research note. 
Uh, and f as, a, as, a, as, as something to focus your minds in this talk, I'm uh, putting forward a sample scenario or a hypothetical scenario uh, which involves you going out and buying an embedded device from some fictional um, vendor of embedded devices somewhere out there in the, in the world. Uh, and you take this embedded device home and you just happen to stick it, uh, plug it into your serial port and uh, have a look at what sort of prompt it's providing and you recognise instantly that it's actually got this fictional um, set of Unix tools for uh, embedded devices which I will call BusyFoss uh, and which is licensed under the GPL. So it's uh, the, the GPL is just to give you a uh, a, a requirement to provide the source code. And you go, oh great, well uh, it's GPL, I must, must have the source code somewhere. So you flip through the box and you look in the manual and you get the CD out and you, you can see every, but there's no source code. And so you go, well, where's my source code? They should, this is infringing, this is an infringing copy on this, on this device. So you go back to the store and you say, where's the source code? Where is it? And the owner says, well, uh, I, I'm not giving you the source code because I don't have it. And then you say, well, you've got to give it to me because you're, this is infringing if you don't give it to me. And then this, this, the vendor of the store says, well, are you actually a copyright holder of this BusyFoss um, software? And you say, no. And then they say, well, then you can't sue me for infringement. So what's the issue? Um, the issue that I've, uh, if you've been listening closely, what I've been talking about is an infringing copy of some open source software. Infringing, by definition, means that it's in breach of copyright, right? Someone can sue you because you're in breach of copyright. That's sort of, um, uh, it's not in contention. And so, um, it, 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 the, it, isn't it just game over? I mean, isn't it, isn't it just game over? It's infringing copy, so let's hit them with, a, with a, a suit for breach of copyright. And the answer is, well, yes, it is um, game over. Um, you can sue these people for a breach of copyright um, if you happen to be the holder of copyright. And if you're not the holder of the copyright, you can't because you're what's called, what the law calls, an intermeddler. Um, you're, you, you don't have um, standing before the court. There's this concept that the court has um, of, um, of standing. And what standing is, is that the court will only listen to, um, will only listen to people who have some sort of connection with the rights which are in dispute, the matter which is in dispute. And the reason the courts do this is because they don't want the whole world coming in and just litigating things if there's no reason to litigate them. And so um, for many, 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 many years, decades, in fact centuries, courts have been excluding people who want to bring a, a, a court action on the basis that that person doesn't have a close enough connection with what's going on, with the matter that's in dispute. And so some examples here are um, if you've got a contract between two people, if, if I've got a contract with you, uh, you know, you want, I'm supposed to bring you a cup of coffee or something and I don't do it or it's too hot or something, um, I'm in breach of contract. Uh, the, f the person, if, you're, if you don't care, you don't care that I'm in flagrant breach by bringing you a, um, a latte rather than a cappuccino, um, the fellow next to you or the person next to you can't do anything. They can't take me to court for breach of contract because my contract is not with that person. Right? My contract is with you. Uh, and the same, um, uh, and, and that's, that's even true if, um, if I'm providing you a, a cup of coffee for you to provide to them um, because the connection is between me and you or the relationship there is between me and you. And it's similar for tort, although tort is a little bit more complex because the relationship in a tort where someone hits somebody or does a wrong to somebody is what tort means. The relationship is defined by the damage and so it's, it's a little bit uh, broader. Um, but basically the court says, well, is this any of your business to the person who is bringing the action? And um, 
if they can't show that they have some uh, interest in the right which is being uh, sued over, then the court just says, well, thank you very much, but, but out you go. And um, this is where you get this concept of amicus curia, where you might have seen it from time to time. It's uh, Latin for friend of the court. Uh, and that's just someone who actually doesn't have an interest in the case, but the court says that they have, that the court thinks that they have something interesting to say, so they let them in on a, lim on a limited basis to say, uh, to make some comment on um, what's going on. And so the short, the, 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 the short, the summary of it is if the, the people who are concerned um, don't have an issue, then the court's not going to listen to you, not going to listen to third parties. And in the case of you and your vendor, um, the distributor is, um, is, or the vendor is A, and the copyright holder is B, but you are this C person. You're outside the circle. You don't have any interest in that copyright in the Busy Foss um, software. And that means that you cannot uh, enforce compliance because you have no standing. Um, whoops. And um, like I said, if you were the copyright holder, you could um, bring, a, bring an action in copyright. But there's often lots of reasons why the copyright holder won't want to bring an action in copyright. Um, in particular, they might not be in Australia. They might be um, somewhere on the other side of the world. They might be too busy. They might have a long list of other non-compliant um, device manufacturers that, that they're going through, and your guy's just down the bottom of the list and they don't want to um, do anything about it. Um, so um, if you're just a consumer buying a device, the Copyright uh, Act is probably not going to help you very much. So flashback to our scenario, and uh, we, just, we, we, we pick up again where the vendor says, well, you're not the copyright holder. Uh, and you go, oh my god, you're right, I'm not. And all of the people who are copyright holders are miles and miles and miles away. And I'll never convince them to come over here to sue you just because I've you know, got an infringing router for 50 bucks or whatever it happens to be. But what you do say is, um, nevertheless, I think you're in breach of the Australian Consumer Law, and which you all know is Schedule 2 of the Competition and Consumer Act 2010, formerly known as the Trade Practices Act 1974. Um, so I'm going to. Uh, I will have standing to bring uh, an action under that legislation um, myself. And the reason that you have standing under the consumer law to bring action, an action is that um, the consumer law is designed specifically to prevent harm to consumers. And uh, you can imagine if you're a consumer and you've been ripped off by $5 or $10 because of some um, something that a, a seller of devices is doing, you're probably just going to chalk it up to experience and not do anything about it. Um, but if everyone in the city or the country um, chalks it up to experience, there's actually quite a lot of damage which is being done to the economy uh, which is not being addressed. And so the legislature tries to, um, tries to be proactive and tries to prevent this harm from happening. And in order to do that, um, it needs to focus on actions of the, uh, the vendors rather than on harm and on rights. Um, and um, uh, that means if it's going to be proactive, proactive, it can't wait until after someone's been hurt. It has to stop the hurt from happening. Um, and, if it's, if it has to, and if it can't wait until someone is hurt, then you're going to have a hard time defining who is that person who has a relationship with the right to take action, right? So if I hit you, um, it's quite clear that you've, got, you've been hurt by me and uh, that, that gives you standing to sue me. But if I'm going to give a right to consumers to take action even before uh, uh, harm happens, then I have, to let, uh, I have to have a very broad concept of standing um, so the, that's what the consumer law does. It allows pretty much anybody to, um, to bring an action where there's a breach uh, of the consumer law. Uh, so flashback to our scenario. And, the, the, and so you say, you've just said, well, I'm going to get you under the consumer law. 
But the vendor then says to you, well, there haven't been any consumer law cases dealing with free and open source software. I mean, you're totally out of left field. How are you ever going to sue me? You know, you're going to be breaking new ground. And your response is, well, you're right. There haven't been any cases specifically on free and open source software, or at least none that I could find. I did have a look. Um, but there are plenty of cases. And um, the principles, uh, those cases establish principles, and they establish them pretty well. So all my job is, is to take those principles and apply them to the facts. Um, and one of, the, one of the early criticisms of the project, uh, of the research that I was doing, was that there weren't any cases on free and open source software. Um, so, so what the research note was doing was sort of going through and seeing, well, what, what sort of cases have come up in other areas, and to what extent can, I, can those cases be applied to this scenario where someone's buying a device um, with a... Um, infringing copy of something on it. So um, what are the sort of things that the, uh, the cases talk about? And the, the two main, the two headline um, consumer law um, sections in the legislation, and I, you might have already heard of them, section 52, which is misleading or deceptive conduct, um, and section 53, which is also misleading or deceptive conduct. But it's... Um, uh, it's sort of like a, a subset of 52. These are, the, these are the two things in the research note that I'm focusing on. Now, there are a couple of other things, but these are sort of like the main, um, the main points. And um, in order to... Oh, sorry, that's, that's the wording of Section 52. That's the, old, that's the old wording as of 31 December last year. The new wording of Section 52 says it's a person but I think it's otherwise unchanged. And Section 53, um, some, of the, some of the wording, in, they've sort of changed the phraseology, but it's pretty much still the same. Um, and basically what you have to do is you have to engage in conduct which is misleading or deceptive and do it, um, do it in trade or commerce. And if you do those things, then you're in trouble. And in fact, you don't even have to be misleading or deceptive you can do something which is likely to mislead or deceive, even though it's not, in fact, misleading. Um, section 53 is sort of like a subset of Section 52. Uh, and it prevents... Uh, uh, and it applies... So 52 is sort of in trade or commerce, and 53 is in trade or commerce in connection with the supply of goods or services. So it's sort of like a zeroing in on, on a specific category of conduct, um, which is a, a supply of things. And the reason Section 53 is, um, is separated out is that uh, it has higher penalties, or it has pecuniary penalties which are attached to it, whereas Section 50, 52 is really just um, damages, which you'd, you'd be exposed to. And um, what Section 53 does there's sort of like a, it's like a dozen subsections where it says, you know, you should no false or misleading representations in relation to this or this or this or this. But these are these are just a couple which I'm I'm pulling out. And so you're not supposed to make false um, representations about sponsorship or approval of a device um, or that it has performance characteristics or benefits. Blah blah blah. Um, the sponsorship or approval of a person. Um, or the, ex the existence or exclusion of any condition, warranty, guarantee, right, or remedy. So, flashback again. I'm sorry to, you know, be making you a little bit dizzy flashing backwards and forwards between this scenario and, and what I'm talking about. But the owner, you've just ex established to the owner that you've, um, you've got a case, or you've got a, a potential case under the, the Trade Practices Act. And then the owner says to you, well, what's your loss? You haven't suffered any loss. And in fact, I haven't even misled you, led you because you knew when you bought that that this was going to be a dodgy product. And so when you bought it, you did it knowing that um, you weren't going to get the, the source code. Uh, in a sense, you probably just bought it so that you could have a go at me because you thought it might be a little bit um, funny. And the, the court's um, response to that is that it doesn't matter. 
Um, I don't need to prove that I've lost, uh, that I've suffered any damage to bring an action. And that's, you can see that because the, uh, you probably can't remember the wording, but part of the wording was that you must not engage in conduct which is likely to mislead or deceive. And so if just being likely to mislead or deceive is, <coughs> mislead or deceive is enough, um, then you don't need to have actually misled somebody. And equally, if you don't need to actually have misled somebody, then you also don't need to show that there's damage because it might be the case you haven't misled somebody. And if you haven't misled somebody, then there's not going to be any damage. Um, and so what the, what's happening here is that the courts are just saying, uh, the courts just look at the set of circumstances. They just look to see whether the conduct has occurred. And if the conduct has occurred, then they say, well, bad luck. You're in breach of the, um, the consumer law. And furthermore, something can be technically true, and yet it can still be misleading. And so um, the example in the cases given is that you know, there's this famous opera singing singer uh, that everybody knows about, and the local theatre is putting on um, a performance by a person of the same name. Um, advertising that person's name may well be misleading or deceptive, even though it's quite true that this person is going to be singing because uh, the average person who sees the advertisements would think it's a different person, depending on how it's, it's advertised. Uh, so you go back to this fellow and say, well, whether or not I was misled is actually not relevant. It's just whether or not your conduct um, is, was misleading. And they said, but I didn't mean to do it. I didn't even know that there was software on it. Uh, I just get this, this stuff from an old lady in Taiwan who makes them in her garage, and she assured me that it was all legitimate. And you say, well, let me tell you about this case called Embo Holdings. So Embo Holdings is a case about an airplane. And in this case, well, there's, there's, uh, there's three protag protagonists, the seller, S, the sales agent for the airplane, A, and the buyer, B. The seller tells the agent that the seller owns the plane. Says to the agent, I own this plane and I want to sell it. Uh, the buyer says to the agent, I'd like to buy a plane. And the agent says to the buyer, well, seller S owns this plane, you could buy it off him. Or I think it was a him. But the fact is, the seller didn't own the plane. Um, but the seller take, took, took the buyer's money um, and, uh, and uh, the buyer didn't get the plane. I think uh, what happened was that there's some registration process where uh, ownership gets transferred by, say, at some register and the, the, the maintainer of the register of the plane said, well, S isn't the seller. Oh, sorry, S isn't, S isn't the owner of the plane. At that point, the buyer could sue the seller to get the money back, except that the seller had got, already taken that money and uh, spent it. So there was no money to get out of the seller. You couldn't actually recover the money. That the buyer couldn't recover the money um, that they had paid. So what the buyer did was they sued the agent. And they sued the agent because the agent told them that the seller owned the plane. And that was false. It wasn't true. Um, and the buyer successfully sued the agent because of that false representation. And the court simply was, um, in the analysis, the court simply said the agent has had some conduct, which is making the statement that the seller owned the plane, and it was false or misleading. And that's all that matters. And when you look at the case, it's quite clear that um, that there was no suggestion that what the agent was doing was blameworthy in any way. The court was just said, well, that's the conduct. You've met the criteria for the conduct. Uh, you're in trouble. Um, so the owner says, uh, OK, all right, fair enough. You've sort of convinced me that I don't need to know what's going on. It just has to be false or misleading. But the thing is, I haven't said anything. What representation have I made to you which is false or misleading? I haven't made, I, you just 
bought this box, there's nothing on the box. I didn't, when you came to buy it from me, I didn't say, oh, by the way, it's got a legitimate copy of Busy Foss on it. I just took your money and that was it. Um, yeah, so where's the, where's the representation? Well, we can have a look um, for where that representation might be to a string of cases by um, a company against people selling PCs with infringing copies of their software on it. And in fact, and, and what's happened in these cases is that um, some person has been selling white box um, PCs and loaded on those white box PCs has been a copy, an infringing copy of this software. And the courts have consistently said that the sale of those PCs with the infringing copies on um, is a representation that the PCs were made with the permission of um, Microsoft in this case. Um, however, so um, what the court said was there's a representation that the software on there has been legitimately loaded up. May, it's been made with permission. But the issue, I guess, with all of these, with a lot of these cases is that the, there were Microsoft trademarks plastered all over the advertisements or over um, the packaging which came with the, uh, with the white box or on the, the thing itself. And so you say to the, the, um, the vendor, well, what about these piracy cases? Uh, and the vendor says to you, well, um, uh, you, those, you, you can't rely on those cases. They're all about trademarks. Trademarks are indicia of... Um, uh, of uh, origin. And so clearly those, they were making representations because they had Microsoft trademarks all over the thing. Whereas that thing you bought didn't mention BusyFoss at all. And in fact, if you look at the code, someone's been trying to go in, going in there, taking out everything which uh, indicates that it is BusyFoss. There's a question. Oh, I don't know. I don't know. Well, yeah, but that's I mean, it's not good. But the thing, but I, I guess I get back to that, that case before. The question was, doesn't that make the owner culpable as hell? Um, and I just take you back to the case before where blameworthy conduct, the, the court's sort of not interested. It's just, it's just the conduct that, that they're trying to establish. But it certainly doesn't look good. Well, it makes the conduct worse, in a sense, yeah. Um, and so the question that you're faced with is, you sort of have to prove that this is a false or misleading misrepresentation. A, um, if you just have a white CD with the words backup CD written on it, uh, and that's all, you, that's all that happens. Well, there's a, on the shelf, you back up white backup CD, you take it to the desk, you pay for it, you walk out. Where's the representation if you were to just buy a backup CD like that? Uh, and you say, well, let me tell you about the TYN case. And the owner's getting a bit upset now because he says, oh, I'm not really sure about this. So, the TYN case, the vendor was selling CDs, white CDs, with the words backup CD written on them. And these CDs had infringing copies of software on them. And the court hit these people under section 52, 53, and a, a number of the subsections of section um, 53. And moreover, the court said that uh, the conduct of the vendor in that case in selling or offering to sell the CDs was an express or implied representation that the items, which is the CDs, were made with the license of the copyright holder uh, or that the vendor was lawfully entitled to um, sell them. So the act of the sale by the vendor in that case, and the court, I mean, this is actually what the court said, said, you've made an express or an implied representation. It's like, well, was it express or was it implied? It sort of covered its bases. They, they didn't make it um, entirely clear. But what, what the court did say was they're in trouble. Um, and so, and they didn't have to show that there were trademarks on it. Um, and you didn't have to uh, identify um, the software on it. So, what about our vendor of the embedded device with the infringing software on it? 
from the TYN case, that person is making a representation. Um, at the very least, that they're entitled to sell it, but also that if there's any software on that thing, then um, it's properly licensed. And from the Embo Holdings case, we also know that whether or not they're aware that the software on it is beside the point. They don't have to know. And they don't have to be intending to mislead you. They can be entirely ignorant and uh, they still have a problem under the Embo Holdings case. So, um, uh, so the owner says to you, well, what, even I, you're saying I'm liable, even uh, if I say nothing about Busy Foss when I sell it to you, and when the packaging on it is also silent, it just tells you about the wonderful features of, of Busy Foss. And you go, yep, that's right. And they say, even if I didn't mean to mislead you, and you go, yep. Um, even if I didn't know that there was a software on it, uh, and even if what I'm doing is not morally blameworthy anyway, and the answer to those questions are, yep, that's right. You might also be exposed to damages, you say. So what can happen if someone's in breach? If you've actually suffered uh, a loss as a result of their, uh, in, of their conduct, their misleading or deceptive conduct, you can get damages, an award of damages, and that compensates you for whatever loss you've suffered. Uh, if you're buying an embedded device, you probably haven't suffered too much loss. Uh, but who knows what the circumstances are. There's scope for mandatory injunctions. And um, an injunction means you stop someone from doing something, but a mandatory injunction means you require them to do something. And typically what happens is that um, you might have corrective advertising um, put in a newspaper or something. And finally, if they're in, in breach of um, that subset of Section 52, which I called Section 53, but is actually Section 29 of the Australian Consumer Law, you can also get um, penalties. Uh, and they're quite substantial, up to a million dollars, if you're a corporation, and not so much if you're an individual, but it's still pretty serious. So, back to the sample scenario. And you say, yeah, you're likely to be in breach of the Australian Consumer Law. And they say, well, fair cop. It's a fair cop. Here's the source code, uh, including the build scripts and the config files. And I make sure that when I'm distributing the devices in the future that I'll uh, uh, put them in, and I'll put an ad in a newspaper, and I'll throw a wad of cash uh, in the way of the busy FOSS developers. And you say, I knew you'd be reasonable. And that's sort of the, that's the talk. Um, there's a stage two to the research which hasn't been done yet and the stage two is to try and do some education of the, um, uh, the, the fair trading departments around, around the country to alert them to the fact that there is an issue here um, that uh, consumers are uh, exposed to um, and also to put together some documentation for people who, if they have a, uh, an issue with, some, with an embedded device, it can at least get them started to send something off to a vendor saying, well, I'm not happy, I want the source code, blah de blah de blah de blah But that second part has not been approved, so the, the, the project, um, stage two of the project isn't going ahead as, of, as yet. Um, there's the mapping, and I will... Um, I guess end there. Any questions? Ah, uh, Ian. Howdy, Brendan. I did make it to your talk, yes. Hey. Finally. Um, first of all, could you go back to one slide or maybe two? Two. Yeah, that one. From the whole conversation with that owner, I was going to gamble that the owner does not actually have the source code to build scripts or the config files, which puts them in a bit of a jam because they're now legally kind of obliged to give it, otherwise they can still be sued, mm -hmm. but they don't have it. Mm -hmm. They might not be able to get it from the little old lady in Taiwan, mm -hmm. who might have disappeared by now. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like one of big production, they sell it cheaply and it's gone. So what do they do? Just stop selling it? I mean, for future things, they'll stop selling it. That's the easy. Yes. But for the stuff they've already sold, what are they going to do to remedy this? Well, I mean, if they can't actually remedy it, they can't actually do it, then they're probably not going to do it. <laughs> I mean, is the, is the, 
the short They're a bit answer. stuck. Yeah, I mean, if they can't, they won't. But yeah. the, the, I mean, the, the issue here is to establish a principle so that if someone is able, they're in a capacity, they're in a, um, they're in a position to be able to comply, you've given them a reason to comply. If they're not in a position to comply, then they're obviously not going to, just you know, as a matter of fact. Yes, so some, some theoretical cases that I would be looking at would be quite interesting in this, but I think it's going to end just about there, I mean, the because the, the it, it's going to, the I story is going to end there, is my point. Right, and the, the point is that you're creating an environment for these vendors so they're feeling uncomfortable, mm -hmm. and so that they start thinking, maybe I'd better do something about it. So the follow-up question on that is, if a couple of these cases were pushed to maybe get a little bit of publicity, or maybe even a case goes to, goes to court over this, isn't the usual stupid business logic then, oh, we, won't, we just won't make sure that there's no FOSS stuff in there so we don't have to fuss about it? Well, Isn't it going to hurt might be. the usual FOSS? Uh, look, um, I would need to... Um, I would need to see how... Because what, what typically happens is it all comes out of somewhere like China or Taiwan. And so if everybody is asking these people in China and Taiwan to provide the source code, I don't think it's going to be big. It might be a big issue for them, but when your buyers have a requirement, you start changing your processes to meet those requirements. And I guess that's where I would see it would be going. Uh, does the owner here get away if it was a white box with only one sticker and no source code included? Sorry, does the... The box contains only one thing on the outside, no software included, no source code. Uh, if, if, if it had no, so no, no software included, that would be a misrepresentation. But if it said no software, no source code. If it said no source code provided... No, no source code. No, 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 okay, but... Well, if, if it says no source code provided, that doesn't get over the representation which is being made, which is it's properly licensed. So the court said, when I'm buying something, when you sell something, you're making a representation that you are able to sell it. And, that, and in addition, that it's properly licensed. Um, and if they're saying that it is properly licensed, that's a misrepresentation. If, if, if the words, if they put something on the box which says, this Not is... Properly <laughs> well, well, but but then they're not allowed to sell it. They have no right to sell it, right? But but yeah, I I don't think you can get around it. If I sold for the purpose of flashing, so was there other? Yeah, it was sort of related if, if they had a big sign up in the store saying um, we make no representations about the availability of you whether this is like properly licensed or whatever. So they don't have no, a right look, to sell it. I, I, I sort of see where everyone's going, but the court, I mean, basically you've got to, you've got to step back a bit and say, well, how's the court going to look at uh, a vendor who's basically saying the Trade Practices Act doesn't apply to me, right, simply by putting a sign up? And will the court say, well, okay, you put the sign up, so I don't have to. You don't have to. You don't have to play by. You don't have to play by the rules that everybody else does. Or will the court say, well, no, get sensible. You're going to still be in trouble. Well, the no refund is. Um, let me take you back a bit. So the no refund comes from. Section 53, existence, exclusion, or effect of any condition, warranty, guarantee, right, or remedy. And there's another section in the Trade Practices Act which says these rights are implied into all consumer transactions. So if they're implied by law into a consumer transaction and you say you don't have that right, that's a false representation about a right. And that's where the, the refund comes from. But basically, you know, if the question is, well, can't they put up something in their store so that it's, they're getting around the Act? Uh, and the answer is, well, I'm, you know, maybe, but I think probably not. And if they put something up, a court's going to be not very happy with them. Because you can't... If, if, basically, the question is, can I opt out of being 
bound by the legislation and the court's going to say, well, no, I'm not going to reach that sort of a conclusion. Uh, but my other question is like about the remedy, if they can't actually remedy the thing, do you think it's likely the court would say, well, this white box thing can't do it, um, you could supply the Netgear one, whatever, that does come with everything and you'll have to pay well, for look, it? Well, ultimately in all, of the, in all of the infringement cases, it comes down to um, what's going to happen in the future. I mean, if you have a look at the, the remedies that have come out of the other cases, it's always, uh, well, in the future, I will make sure I put the source code up and I will do something like put the past source code up on a, a site somewhere. Um, so um, the question was, effectively, can you substitute something? Um, but I... I I think that would just depend on the circumstances, but I, I don't think just substituting something is, it's probably not going to get you there. What about the case when they only give you the bare minimum to be in compliance with the licence? So they give you the source code but not all the build tools or the f tools to reflash the well, ROMs? Well, the, the, the issue is, are you, is an infringing copy? And if it's an infringing copy, then they've got a problem. And if you look at the GPL, the GPL has that wording that covers that. But the other licences don't go into the detail, and so you might have to argue the toss. Uh, and if you have to argue the toss, it's really just a question of, is it worth the effort to argue the toss with them? And probably not. Uh, Steve's, Steve? There's a couple of people down here too, Steve. Uh, I wonder if the more worrying problem for most of the people in this room is that they are actually more likely to be in the position of the little lady in Taiwan, that we're actually manufacturing um, stuff which we then sell uh, and we are likely to be caught on the other side of the fence. Um, and, and to me, it, like, that, that's an interesting example, but the lesson that I take away from that is that there's an awful lot of care that we need to take in putting, in using open source stuff, either in embedded devices or in even websites? Well, I mean, um, the answer is yes, but there's nothing, in a sense, you know, the ground was broken by Microsoft with closed source software, and so this is not, this is sort of uh, taking it, seeing whether the existing stuff, you know, these court cases are about Microsoft Office and Microsoft Windows, um, so I don't see there's anything, um, I don't see that you have to take extra care in relation to open source, I guess is the, is the, the comment I'm saying. I, I, what I see it is you've got to take care and you might have to do different things, but it's the sort of the same sort of, the same class of care you have to take. Uh, so your, your example was really um, as the, the agent of the middleman. Um, you know, to represent the seller, but in many other forms of law, there's uh, kind of a, the representation of first sale from manufacturer, uh, which is somewhat more ignorant of a reseller model. So books and media and you know tangible goods and so on. Isn't there some kind of um, in this particular example to actually just go at the manufacturer uh, and not really focus on the agent and whether he represented it accurately or not? I mean, this is, um, um, this doesn't get the manufacturer off the hook. Um, it's just saying, uh, effectively what it's saying is uh, middle, middle people cannot simply say, well, I didn't know, and, 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 and therefore bat off any issues that might come up. Um, if it's a consumer transaction, and what I didn't say is that that means it's for less than $40,000, so if it's over $40,000 it doesn't count, but if it's a consumer transaction then what the law, what the legislature has done in, in doing the consumer law is saying, well, if you're a consumer, you don't have to chase up the chain to find somebody, we will let you just go after whoever you can find, and effectively that's why you don't have that first sale sort of. Is that, is that purely from like a financial remediation standpoint, not so 
much to actually solve the, uh, the legal copyright type infringement standpoint. To go after the, the person you bought it from would be to recoup your expense. It, it's really maybe the consumer protection part of that. But if you're the owner of copyright, going after the person you purchased from is not going to be as effective as going after the, the manufacturer. Who well, that's... Good. that's that's sort of true and it's sort of not true because it's in, insofar as manufacturers have to sell to somebody and if it's a reseller, if all of the resellers are worried that this fridge, um, for example, doesn't get as cold as it's supposed to do, it's supposed to get, and they're going to get sued if they sell this fridge, that goes back up the chain to the manufacturer. So it's not like um, having pressure on the resellers is not pressure on the manufacturer. It, it does put pressure on the manufacturer. Um, in terms of being the agent, what sort of things do we have to look out for when we're delivering um, software? I've, uh, I've got a website contract, I pull off the shelf website system, I'm driven by a community pro project, deliver it to the client. Um, what sort of things do I need to look out for? Am I exposed to bugs that somebody else introduced uh, if their site doesn't work because they've got the manual from somewhere else? And doesn't work, can, well, can he I, gun me I, for... I, I think... I think I well, think, it doesn't matter. Well, I mean, I think, I think that's a question that can't be sort of answered right here and now. It's Correct. something you need to... What, what are the things that we need to be worried about, though? All right, well, just as a, as a general statement about contracting, you just have to be clear about what it is you're providing and what it is you're not providing. So, for example... Um, uh, often in a contract, if there's an open source component and I'm drafting it, I'll just say we're not providing you the, the software. We're not giving you a license to this software, which is true, right? Open source software is typically licensed from a third party being the copyright holder. If you, um, if you, and, and then it'll come down to a decision you're making about whether or not you want to take some responsibility if there's anything wrong with the, wrong with the software for which you would probably charge a premium to respond to and you might have a, uh, a tiered structure for responding to it. If it's like this, then we'll do this and we'll do this, this and this. Or you might say, well, if there's anything wrong with it, well, it's just not our problem. And when the reason it's not our problem is we're not charging you for it and you've got to understand that and if you're not happy with it, then don't buy it from us. Yeah, it's just... Mm. The answer would be the same. Yeah. Nice to know you're all listening. Say I buy this busy FOSS device. device as a consumer, and then a couple of months later I sell it on eBay. Am I then liable? Uh, technically, probably. But the question is, you know, who's going to go at you? Right, that's all we have time for. Thanks, right. guys. I'm sure Brendan will be able to... I'd just like to thank Brendan for talking to us today on behalf of Linux Australia as a small gift. Thank, thank you. you.